Today we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th Canto, Chapter 5, Text 19. Gopan Gokula Rakshayam Nirupya Maturam Gataha Nandakam Sasya Varshikyam Karam Datum Kurudvaha Gopan, the cowherd men, Gokula Rakshayam, in giving protection to the state of Gokul, Nirupya, after appointing, Maturam, to Matura, Gataha, went, Nandaha, Nanda Maharaj, Kangshasya, of Kamsa, Varshikyam, yearly taxes, Karam, the share of profit, Datum, to pay, Kuru Udvaha, Omaraj Pradikshit, best protector of the Kuru dynasty. Translation and purport by Srila Prabhupada. Sukadev Goswami continued, Thereafter, my dear King Parikshit, O best protector of the Kuru dynasty, Nanda Maharaj appointed the local cowherd men to protect Gokul and then went to Mathura to pay the yearly taxes to King Kamsa. <coughs> Purport. Because the killing of babies was going on and had already become known, Nanda Maharaj was very much afraid for his newborn child. Thus he appointed the local cowherd men to protect his home and child. He wanted to go immediately to Mathura to pay the taxes due and also to offer some presentation for the sake of his newborn son. For the protection of the child, he had worshipped various demigods and forefathers and given charity to everyone's satisfaction. Similarly, Nanda Maharaj wanted not only to pay Kamsa the yearly taxes, but also to offer some presentation so that Kamsa too would be satisfied. His only concern was how to protect his transcendental child, Krishna. Oma Jnana Timurandasya Jnananjana Salakaya Chakshuran Militam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine so Nanda Maharaj had just completed the fabulously gorgeous birth ceremony of his son, Sri Krishna. But he had a responsibility to go to Mathura to pay the yearly taxes. And he decided he would do that after completing the birth ceremony, which took quite a few days. Now, Vasudeva on the other side of the Jamuna was anxiously waiting for Nanda Maharaj because Vasudev did not know yet whether Nanda Maharaj understood that he had kidnapped the daughter and put in place his son, Sri Krishna, Vasudev. So after Nanda Maharaj paid the taxes, he came to stay in one place temporarily and Vasudev immediately went to see him. And Vasudev told him that you're Elder age now, all these years you didn't have any children. Now by the grace of the Lord you have a son. Though in old age usually one has a daughter because of the lack of strength. So he, just with this little hint, he wanted to see if Nanda Maharaj in any way understood that the exchange of the babies had been made. But Nanda Maharaj immediately began to console Vasudev, who was his brother, like a younger brother to him. And Prabhupada explains that um, according to Madhavacharya, Surasain had married a Vaishya wife and from that Vaishya wife, wife came Nanda Maharaj who was older to Vasudev and from the Kshatriya wife came Vasudev. So they were actually just like brothers. So Nanda Maharaj consoling Vasudev, he said, you had so many sons but all of your sons were killed by this treacherous Kamsa. 
Now, we learned that the Kshatriya's duty is to accept taxes and then to give, in exchange for that, to give protection to the prajas. But here, because of the demoniac nature of Kamsa, the killing of babies was already going on. Anyone who had uh, come, taken birth within the last 10 days of the birth of when uh, Durga Devi appeared to Kamsa, uh, he had sent out his ministers to kill. So Nanda Maharaj was especially worried for his son. Therefore, he left the ma majority of the cowherd men in Braj, in Gokul, to protect his son and all the other women and children there, while he very quickly went to uh, Mathura to pay the taxes. So with this birth ceremony, today we're selling another celebrating another birth ceremony, and that is the divine appearance of our Param Guru Maharaj, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami. He appeared in 1874 on February 6th, 3.30 p.m. in the Holy Dham of Sri Jagannath Puri. His family line goes back all the way to Brahmaji. They can, the genealogical table uh, comes through Chitragupta, from Chitragupta to uh, Angira Muni, going on from king, <coughs> kings to kings, Bharadraj Maharaj, then kings within Bengal, finally coming to the um, father of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Kedarnath Datta. Now Kedarnath Datta, being highly educated, being also a pure devotee aside from that, qualified in both realms, he was um, awarded by the British uh, rule at that time to the highest position that an Indian was able to serve in, in the British rule. And that was uh, deputy commissioner, deputy magistrate. And at that time, he was assigned to Jagannath Puri. So he moved there with his family. And he lived just less than a quarter of a kilometer from the Jagannath temple in a rented home, which was very near to the Jagannath Balab Udayan, where Jagannath, uh, Lord Chaitanya used to rest during the Ratiyatra, right on the Grand Road. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati being born in February, five months after his birth, the Ratiyatra festival was going to come. But before his birth, because Srila Bhakti Uno Thakur, he had a mission in life, and that was he wanted to resurrect the pure Siddhantic teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because for the past 300 years, those teachings had been covered by the Sahajiyas, by the Smarta Brahmins, by the Jati Gosais, and he, along with the persons that also had the same uh, mood as him, he wanted to start a movement. And his dream was to bring the entire world through the process of Sankirtan Yagya to the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This was his projected dream, and today we are realizing that dream, all sitting here together. One night he had a dream and Lord Jagannath came to him. And he said, I did not bring you here to engage in legal affairs. I want you to preach the pure Siddhanta of Bhakti. And Bhakti Unod Thakur, he prayed to Jagannath Ji that you please give me one of the persons from your own personal staff to assist me. So Jagannath Ji recommended to Bhakti Unod Thakur you worship Bimala Devi. Bimala Devi, if anyone goes to the Jagannath temple, she is Yogamaya in the form of Durga Devi, who is residing just next to the Jagannath temple. And any prasad that is offered to Jagannath Ji, before it's considered Mahaprasadam, is first brought and offered to Bimala Devi as Yogamaya. So, offering prayers to Bimala Devi, the sixth child, the fourth son, by the second wife of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, took birth on this day, today, 
which corresponded to February 6th, the Bengali month of Magh, uh, on the Panch, this Panchami. So at the time of his birth, as usual, the astrologers were called, and they all said that they had never seen any chart as this child's. First, he had all of the 32 distinguished markings on his body of a great personality. Those 32 markings are also mentioned in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, the high places, the broad places, the reddish places, the short places, the long places, all on the body of a great personality or the Supreme Personality of Godhead. His name was given as Bhima Prashad because by the mercy of Bhimala Devi, this child appeared. So when Bhaktivinoda Thakur heard from the Jyotish uh, pundits that this great personality had appeared in his family, he realized that this is the person who has been sent by Lord Jagannath to assist him to reestablish pure bhakti. So he took special care Although it was his sixth child, fourth son, he took special care of this particular child and particularly of his education. Because at that time, because in the mixture of the East and West in India, he knew that if this child was going to be a great preacher, he had to have the type of education where the whole world would listen to him. So at just 10 months old, he had his wife take him by Palanquin all the way to Nadia district to Ranagat, where he would grow up in his infancy and get a good education there. So from Ranagat, then um, Bhakti Vinod Thakur was transferred to Hooghly, and there he began to build a house. So as uh, at that time Bhimala Prashad grew, he was brought there to Calcutta to get a good education in fine schools. When he was just seven years old, he had already memorized the entire Bhagavad Gita. And while Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur was uh, constructing a house, while they were digging to make the foundation of the house, he discovered a Kurma Shila there. Now because of the Smarta Brahmin influence at that time, only Brahmins were allowed to worship Shalagram Maharaj. But seeing the qualities of this child and the affection that the child had for the Sheila upon seeing the Sheila, he decided to give the Sheila to Bhimal Prashad. At the same time, he decided to initiate him into the Harinam uh, chanting of Japa and also to give him a Nushinga mantra. This was at age seven. So from the age of seven, he was taught to apply tilak, which he always did from that time. He was chanting on Japa Mala, and he began the worship of Kurma Dev. Now the Acharyas say that this worship of Kurma Dev is very important because at the very end of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Sukadev Goswami, he invokes Kurma Dev just before he starts to give the, the listings of the different numbers of verses and things like that. When he's finished speaking the message of Bhagavatam, he invokes Kurmadev because when Kurmadev was sitting beneath the Mandara mountain and the churning was going on, the sharp rocks were uh, scratching his body and he was getting pleasure from that. And he was breathing very nicely in and out. And that breathing, that breathing is what the ocean is, the coming and going of the tides. And if we meditate on that breathing, we become peaceful and we can remember the Supreme Lord because from there all of the Vedas are coming, the breathing of the Lord. So that's the first significance of Kurma Dev, that he was invoked at the end of Bhagavatam. Also Kurma Dev, according to the Shastras, he is the deity of the Adbhutaras. Adbhutaras is the Ras of wonder and all of the Leela of the Supreme Lord are combined with this Adbhutaras and particularly the Leela of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Srila uh, Krishnadas Kaviraj, he uses so many words meaning 
Adbut, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita to describe the different pastimes of the Lord. So there also Goranga Mahaprabhu is present in this Adbut Ras of Kurma, Kurma Dev. Aside from that, <clears throat> um, when Goranga Mahaprabhu would experience the topmost ecstasies of Vipralamba Bhav, he would assume the form of Kurma Dev when his arms and legs would be contracted into his body. So with all of these meditations, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati began his worship of age seven as an initiated Vaishnava and continued throughout his life. Then continuing with his education, he was a very serious student, but he understood that though his other family, uh, friends the children of his age, just like with Prahlad Maharaj, they were engaged in pr frivolous activities. But he was rather, he began a society called the Chir Kumar Sangha. Chir Kumar means, it's another word for brahmachari. That they took a vow together that they would remain brahmacharis for their whole life. Well, none of them remained brahmacharis except for Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. And he realized that what is the purpose of getting a good education? We get a good title, we get good marks, uh, we're able to show our degree. For what purpose? The purpose is just to enter into family life, get a nice wife, have a distinguished family, a good name. So he wasn't interested in any of those things. And even while he was studying up to college time, he would keep Narutam Das Thakur's two books, Pratna, and Prema Bhakti Chandrika, and he would, like we have a book, he would keep them inside and read them. And once one of his elders caught him and rebuked him. He said, you're supposed to be studying. Why do you have these books? So then secretly, he would take other books only in Sanskrit. And those two books were Gita Govinda and Krishna Karnamrita. And because they were in Sanskrit, his family members couldn't read them. So <laughs> in that way, Instead of studying carefully in his subject matters, he was studying the Vaishnav literatures, even through his study time. So when he was in college, he took an interest in Jyotish, not for the purpose of prediction, because nowadays Jyotish is primarily used for uh, knowing what's going to happen in our life without understanding the mathematical calculations and all of the intricacies of Jyotish. He was interested because for setting up a panjika, which was what his father wanted for the Vaishnavas, because in those days they only had smarta panjikas. And the smarta panjikas would do things differently, of course, as the Vaishnavas. So Bhakti Uno Thakur wanted a Vaishnava panjika, just as we're following. And that first Navadri panjika was established by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati through his great knowledge of Jyotish. When he was 15 years old, he translated the uh, different Surya Siddhanta and the uh, Siromani, Siddhanta Siromani, which were very ancient um, textbooks on Jyotish that were supposedly given by the demigods to the humans for how to calculate. So because of this great work, he was awarded by the Jyotishas at that time because the Siddhanta means the Jyotish literature. And Siddhanta, his name was Siddhanta Saraswati. So they added the name Saraswati because anyone who was a great learned person, that means that they were blessed by the goddess of learning Saraswati. So from that time onwards, from the age of 15, he was known publicly as Siddhanta Saraswati. But because of his great learning, he never compromised. And even his professors in college, some of whom were Christian, some of whom were atheists, some of one of them, even the principal of the college, he would challenge them on matters of Jyotish because he didn't agree with the combining of the Western astrology with the Vedic astrology. So, because he had a disagreement with the principal of the college, he decided, uh, for the sake of integrity, he should leave the college. And his brother at that time, 
was engaged as a dewan in Tripura because Bangladesh, Bang, Bangabhumi was all one big state at that time, but there were li different Vaishnava kingdoms. These Vaishnava kingdoms were started about 300 years earlier by Narottam Das Thakur's disciples who went there to, to preach. And the lineage of the Tripura state at that time was purely Vaishnava. The whole state was Vaishnava, as was Manipur. So they had, he had one of his brothers there already. And the king invited Bhaktivinoda Thakur to come and visit him. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur took his son, Siddhanta Saraswati. And at that time, the king employed also Siddhanta Saraswati in his kingdom. So he stayed there for some years. He became even more learned because of the great Vaishnava library that the king had. And he was sent then by the king back to Calcutta to run the administrative offices of the kingdom. Just as in Delhi, each, there's Baroda House, Patiala House, each different kingdom would have their houses. And at that time, Calcutta was the capital of India. So Tripura State also had their capital building there in Calcutta. So when Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati returned to Calcutta, uh, he was already with a very good position. He was a moneyed man because he was getting good, good salary from the king of Tripura. But he noticed the rot within the offices of the kingdom. And he pointed all of that out to the king. And after some time working within the offices, he decided that there's no hope for this. Better I leave this. Because after studying the Vaishnava literatures for so many years, and with the example of his father, he saw within his own life a dichotomy. Dichotomy means there's a, a breaking. He knew what the f perfect philosophy was, but he wasn't living that philosophy. So he went and returned to his father, who by that time was there in um, Godruma Dweep, and he explained the problem that he was having in his spiritual life. And his father recommended to him that he take shelter of a Babaji who had just recently come from here, from Braj. He had been doing bhajan here for nearly 30 years. His name was Gaur Kishore Das Babaji. And when Gaur Kishore Das Babaji heard that Bhaktivinoda Thakur, with the assistance of um, the blessings of Jagannath Das Babaji, had manifested the actual birthplace of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and established the worship there of Goranga and Vishnu Priya, Gorkishore Das Babaji left Braj and came to Nabadweep to take darshan and to also hear from Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati at that time, uh, he considered himself a mo very moral person, very learned, very qualified on the material aspects of uh, erudition. So when he saw for the first time his spiritual master, everything that he considered of value in his life was completely crushed to dust. He realized he had absolutely no qualification whatsoever because he lacked that pure bhakti that his spiritual master was the personification of. Sakshad vairagya murtaye. He was the personification of renunciation. And what was it that he renounced? All of the things that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had considered important in his life, including morality and scholarship. Gorkishore Das Babaji, he couldn't even sign his name, which is common in those days. Most people were illiterate in India. But he had such knowledge just by hearing. And he would carry with him also Narottam Das Thakur's books of bhajan. So he once haughtily said to his Guru Maharaj that you worship that cheater and debauchee, Sri Krishna. So how can I understand him, who is so attached to morality and scholarship? So from that time onwards, he realized there was no way he could get the mercy of his spiritual master unless he gave up this false conception of what was of value in this world. 
And again and again, he pleaded with his spiritual master to please accept him as a disciple. And his spiritual master explained to him that I had already accepted one disciple and he cheated me. So I decided I'm not going to accept any more disciples. But after pleading again and again and his spiritual master refusing him, uh, from one bhajan, karuna na paile, kandiya kandiya, prana, Huh. Prana Nara uh, Because I'm not receiving your mercy, I'm simply crying and crying, and I do not want to keep my life anymore. Now, there are some anomalies that have developed within ISKCON. <clears throat> this particular sloka that was spoken by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati somehow or other came to mean within ISKCON that he threatened to give up his life. It wasn't a threat. It was a crying of anguish. That how, what is the use of my life unless I get the mercy of my spiritual master? Uh, there's another anomaly that uh, we, has to be corrected. Uh, we call Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati the Singha Guru. Uh, he was never called the Singha Guru at that time. There was a great freedom fighter, Desh Bandhu Chittaranjandas. Now when he saw the incredible resurrection, renaissance, that Bhakti Vinod Thakur through his son, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, was initiating first in Bengal and Orissa, he gave the name to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Acharya Kesari, which means Lion Guru. But that was the actual words that were spoken, Acharya Keshari. Same meaning, but we should get that right. <laughs> because sometimes over the years, because even the biography, we were very fortunate for the case of Srila Prabhupada. Uh, immediately after his disappearance, all, we had tape recorders in those days and there were interviews. People went around all over the world to get the interviews. So within a few years, we were able to receive Sri uh, Prabhupada Lilamrita. But that didn't happen in the case of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. And it took many, many years to unravel. You would hear the same Lila, but from so many different perspectives, it wasn't even possible to understand what the truth was. For instance, after having taken initiation, there was one educated young man who came, he was looking for a guru, and when he met Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, because he had been given the assignment by his father to develop the yoga pit. So he was busy in acquiring land, taking care of the finances, establishing the temple, finding manpower to take care of the temple. And when this young man saw that he was engaged in all of this administrative work, he rejected Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. And then he went to his guru, he jumped over him, went to his guru, Gorkishor Das Babaji, and uh, stayed clear, close to him in, a, in another latrine. And he wouldn't allow Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati to even come and see his guru. So this particular person, he's called one name in one story, one name in another story. Finally, uh, Gorkishor Das Babaji himself voluntarily put his feet on the head of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati in front of this young man and completely exposed the misdeeds that this young man was doing. That all of the offerings that were coming for Gorkishore Das Babaji, that he, wouldn't, he wasn't accepting them, but this young man would take them and eat them himself. And with the strength he was getting from all those milk and fruits and everything, at night he would enjoy with other people's wives. So all of this was known by Gorkishore Das Babaji, and it, he exposed this so-called follower of his openly. And then some say that he went home and, and got deathly sick and married. Others say he became a tantric. So it's very hard to unravel all of these stories. But we have the writings of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. So basically his life was broken into three different eras. One was his student life, which was before the time that he met his spiritual master. And then after his spiritual master, by the influence of Vairagya Murti, 
uh, Gorkishor Das Babaji, he took to bhajan. And that bhajan was very severe. Um, he had tried to, he was performing already on the example of Jagannath Das Babaji, the full Chaturmasa Vrat. Uh, the gogras he would eat only once in the evening, rice that he had cooked himself, but he was becoming sickly from that. So his father requested him not to do that. But when he learned from his spiritual master about bhajan, he took a very severe vow. And that was he would do Shatakoti Nam. And that is to chant three lakhs of the holy name every day until one completes one billion names of the Lord. And he hoped that through that, he would get inspiration to fulfill the desires of his father who wanted him to preach Shud Bhakti. So this took him uh, nine years and four months to complete. But he did not just sit and chant bhajan. During that time, uh, he was called by his father. His father had become a little ill. And when he was uh, called for debate with the smart Brahmins, because he couldn't attend, he sent his son. And he was able to completely defeat, through debate, Shastric, uh, Shastric uh, sources, how anyone can become a Vaishnava. It's not that only you have to be a Brahmin and then as a Brahmin you become a Vaishnava. Anyone could become a guru. And through this Shastric evidence, he was able to defeat, defeat the smart Brahmins. Because the smart Brahmins were defeated by Shastra, they then went on to attack Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because it was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who first established this principle that anyone could become a Vaishnava. He it, uh, made Haridas Thakur, who was Brahmin, brought in a Muslim family, as the Namacharya, just as an example. So then they attacked Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that he's not mentioned anywhere in Shastra, that actually he says he's his devotee, he's not the Supreme Lord. And again, for the second time, he was able, uh, Bhakti Santa Saraswati was able to defeat them. So his preaching was going on very strongly, even while he was doing his vrat. He also went to Puri and did bhajan there with the blessings of his father. He also took a tour of South India. Now in South India, he saw, because in South India there are still pure sampradayas, Vaishnav Sampradaya, that of the Sri Sampradaya and the Madhav Sampradaya. And he saw that within the Sri and Madhav Sampradaya there were sannyasis. There were no sannyasis in the Gaudiya Sampradaya. At that time there were Babajis, but even the Babajis primarily, many of them were Sahajiyas. So he decided that our Gaudiya Sampradaya requires sannyasis. And he studied very carefully the Sri Sampradaya, the Madhva Sampradaya, and also the Shankara Sampradaya, the Mayavadis. Because in order to defeat someone, you have to enter within and understand what their weak points were. So while he was in South India, he studied these three, these three doctrines. And then when he came back uh, in 1914, his father disappeared. And soon after that, just a, over a year later, his Guru Maharaj disappeared. And then he was completely alone, 1914, 1915. Completely alone in the world. Who was he going to take inspiration from? His two mentors had disappeared. Who was he going to show his writings to? Who was going to give him orders how to preach? So for three years, he did not feel qualified to carry on the orders uh, that his father had given him. His father, at that time, after his father disappeared, he was praying for some guidance. How should he continue? Because he wanted to fulfill this desire of Shud Bhakti to be spread all over the world. And it's described that one gust of wind came and one sloka from the Chaitanya Charitamita came before him. And within that sloka, three things were 
given to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Gauranam, Gauradam, and Gora Kam. Because in that sloka, uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was instructing Sanatan Goswami what his responsibilities were. Gauranam, he should preach the holy name all over the world. Gauradam, he should establish the holy places. So that was what Bhakti Vinod Thakur was doing. He was establishing the yog pit in Mayapur. And there was great opposition from the Kulina Brahmins, from those in Navadweep, who established there as the birthplace. So at every step, there was struggle. So Gordanam, Gordadam, and Gordakam. Gordakam means what was the desire of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And we know that was the desire that his name be heard in every town and village of the world. So with these three directions, he then in 1918 decided that he would accept the order, he would be the first Vaishnava sannyasi within the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. And because there were no other sannyasis in this Sampradaya before him, he placed a photo of his Guru Maharaj and took the danda and accepted the sannyas order. At the same time, he established the temple of Gandharvika Giridhari in Mayapur. And by the establishment of that temple, he began uh, the Gaudiyamath. Now, it, the name Gaudiyamath came afterwards uh, because what Bhaktivinoda Thakur had established was the uh, Vishva Vaishnava Raja Sabha. To Vishna, Vishva Vaishnava Raja, the Vaishnava Raja is who? That Sri Krishna of the whole universe. And the Sabha means for establishing pure bhakti to Sri Krishna. So this Vishva Vaishnava Raja Sabha was just like Srila Prabhupada when he incorporated International Society for Krishna Consciousness in New York. It was a legal entity. So that was the name of the legal entity of all of the places that Bhakti Vinod Thakur wanted to establish and did establish. And as Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati established centers, that was also the name. But because the, it was the teachings of the Gaudiya Vaishnavism, uh, publicly it was called the Gaudiya Mats. And that was how this name Gaudiya Mat came about. It was a public acceptance. But the actual name was Vishva Vaishnava Raja Sabha. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he was already at that time accepting disciples. And he saw from without five major enemies that he had to defeat on the philosophical level. Um, <clears throat> he saw the smart Brahmins that felt that they had the whole hold on Vaishnavism. You couldn't become a Vaishnava, you couldn't take Diksha except through them. He saw the Jati Gosais, who were the descendants of the disciples of the six Goswamis. We have them here in Vrindavan also. Uh, in Bengal it was very prominent. They had complete control of the temples so that no one could worship even the Supreme Lord except through them. You had the, um, one of the em enemies was the Bhagavatam reciters, the professional reciters, who had taken, these were the very things, you couldn't take diksha, you couldn't worship, you couldn't even hear Srimad Bhagavatam purely. Uh, only through these Bhagavatam reciters who were using this as a profession to maintain their family. So they were considered also as enemies. Then you had the Apasampradayas who were identified by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. They all had to be thoroughly smashed. And on top of that, you had the Mayavadis, you had the atheists, and you had those who were trying to um, establish the Western theology and Western ideology as superior to our Vedic culture. So he had many external enemies who he had to fight. And now he was collecting an army of Vaishnavas who he was training from within this Gaudiyamat to help him. He would send them out. Now, you will, if there's a wonderful anthology com, uh, compiled by our godbrother 
Sri Bhakti Vikas Swami took him many years to compile and as if, any, if anyone takes the time to read that you'll see that the challenges that were there at that time when Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati established his society the exact mirror image are the challenges that we have here within ISKCON and how he solved those problems are a great source of inspiration for us. For instance, within the society, within the temples, there were also conflicts. There were also problems. I won't name all of them because there are so many, <laughs> so many problems, but there were some major problems that we still experience within ISKCON. One was there was a division. There was an administrative class of disciples and there was a educational class of disciples and they would fight with each other who is more important and who is doing the greater service to their Guru Maharaj. So the administrative class, they would take care of all the managerial work, the finances, establishing the temples and then the other side, they would take care of all the preaching work. So Srila Bhakti Saranta Saraswati, he said that the administrators, they are my vapu and the preachers they are my vani but we must always remember that the vapu is there to support the vani to serve the vani so all of these temples all of this administration and management is being done simply so that the preaching can go on then he had the problem of the brahmacharis and the sannyasis now the sannyasis although they were meant to be thoroughly renounced uh, there was something that um, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati termed as Babu Giri. All Bengalis know what Babu Giri means. It means uh, being the master. <laughs> so he gave so many, 18 different points, how we have to get rid of this Babu Giri mentality if we're sannyasis. Sannyasi means we have to serve everyone in the mud. We are the servants of all the people in the mud. He said they're not allowed to get extra milk. They're not allowed to have extra uh, special cooking arrangements for themselves. They're not allowed to have servants. They're not allowed to have people massaging their feet. They're not. So many restrictions he gave just to stop this mentality because what was happening was the brahmacharis wanted to take sannyas just so that they could get all these extra facilities. Now, does that sound familiar? <laughs> So all of these problems were right there from the very beginning. Then there was the conflict between the Matavasis, people living in the temple, and the Grihastas. Grihastas would say, well, we're supporting the temple. We're very important. And the Matavasis would say, yeah, but you're not doing any service in the temple. You're just giving some money. And then you come and you want to take all the prasadam. So they were always, <laughs> always going on like this. So how did Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati solve this? He said that any grihasta who's living outside, according to the Shastra, and he quoted different slokas, anyone can serve the Supreme Lord. It doesn't matter what their varna is, it doesn't matter what their ashram is. But if you're a grihasta living outside and you want to take prasadam in the temple, you must do service in the temple. So very simple solutions Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati gave for all of the problems that are, we have inherited <laughs> uh, through our Guru Maharaj's service. Now, um, another thing was his chastisement. Now, Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada learned everything from his spiritual master. And Srila Prabhupada liked very much the words that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati would use when he chastised his disciples. He would say, rascal, foolish, stupid, and the disciples could, would consider that to be a blessing. They would say, there are two sweet things, Prabhupada er dal and Prabhupada er gal. Gal means scolding, right? His chastisement. So whenever they would get chastised by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, they would run and tell the other god brothers, that, oh, he just chastised me, and they would share that because they knew that that was a blessing. 
They knew that if they were being chastised by their Guru Maharaj, it means he accepted them. But some of the higher-ups, he would not chastise them directly by calling them names, by yelling at them. He would, in a class, in his pravachan, he would speak about what the diversion was and publicly speak about how this had to be corrected. So no one, no one was bereft of getting that sweetness of the chastisement of the spiritual master. If anyone fell asleep in Bhagavatam class, he would yell at them. He would say, I have invited all of the Acharyas. I've invited Srila Bhakti Uno Thakur. I've invited Gorkishore Das Babaji. And you're sleeping. And if they see you sleeping, they'll all go away. So wake up. Then another time he said, when someone was sleeping, he said, take him and throw him into Radhakund. <laughs> Now, this was the Radhakund that he had manifested there at the yog pit in Nabadweep. Because as a pure devotee, <laughs> he had the vision that all of the Acharyas aspire for. He saw the non-difference between Brajadam and Goradam. So with his vision, through his, after chanting one billion holy names of the Lord, hopefully um, he was able to see Gauradam is non-different from Brajadam. So he established all of those places in, around the yog pit as non-different from the places in Brajadam. So that's why there's also a Radha Kun there. Now, in front of the temple that he established at the yog pit, he also established what's called a Natya Mandir, which is an open place where one carries on the Sankirtan in front of the deities. And he said that at that Natya Mandir, there should always be the Sankirtan Yagya going. So generally, when we think of Yagya, we think of a fire. So that fire, now fires have different tongues. That's when they flare up. He says that this Sankirtan Yagya has seven tongues. And these seven tongues are, the, he took the first sloka of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's uh, Sikshastakam. He said one of the tongues is Cheto Darpana Marjanam. And then he went through the entire sloka up to Pratipadam Purnamrita Svadhanam. And how these seven tongues of Sankirtan should always be burning within this Natya Mandir. So in that way we can meditate on the teachings. There's, it's like an ant in front of a mountain of sweets. There's so much to say about Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. But now it's time to glorify a pure devotee, a disciple of Srila, Srila Prabhupada, Gorkishore Das Babaji. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Jai. What did I say? Oh, excuse me. Gorgovinda Maharaj, our dear God brother, who joined here as a bhakta, got initiated here, and then was sent by Prabhupada to Orissa to begin the preaching there. Hare Krishna.